This is CBC Vancouver News. These unprecedented events, unfortunately, are likely going to become more commonplace. They're, we're bound to repeat the mistakes we, we made on November 29th. Cleanup efforts are underway following BC's latest snowstorm. And... ...made it clear that users could face unacceptable fare hikes if we didn't step in. The province is committing $500 million to keep BC ferry fares affordable. Plus... Vancouver Arbutus in South Vancouver is just going to lead to a situation where our community's capacity is diminished. Outcries from Vancouver's South Asian community over proposed changes to some federal electoral boundaries. A winter snowstorm battered much of BC overnight and Environment Canada says more will be in store for the southern part of the province. As Ali Patarge reports in Metro Vancouver, cleanup efforts are underway after wet, heavy snow down trees caused numerous power outages and left some buses struggling on the slick roads. People across the province waking up to a winter wonderland. Up to 25 centimetres fell across Metro Vancouver Saturday and into Sunday morning. The wet, heavy snow causing issues for public transit Saturday, with some buses struggling on the slick roads, forcing some to abandon routes. The BC Ministry of Transportation says road and bridge maintenance crews are out in full force Sunday, and municipalities are busy cleaning up the aftermath. We've been working through the, any issues that have come up throughout the day. With the snow being heavier, we are seeing some trees falling. We're going to be going through a lot of freeze and thaw cycles. Um, so if you could help us out, just if you're out there clearing catch basins, ensure the roads are getting drained properly. The storm downing trees across the province, including this large tree in East Vancouver. The steady snowfall has led to road closures, transportation delays, dozens of cancelled flights and thousands without power. With this heavy snowfall, there can be some power outages and such. So just be prepared in case your power does go out. And uh, in general, just keep an eye on the forecast for precipitation and especially snowfall amounts. And at higher elevations, nearly 50 centimeters of snow fell. The city of Squamish advising drivers to slow down on the Sea to Sky Highway and avoid unnecessary travel. I would hope everybody sort of takes that, that chance to think about, do I really need to go out there? clearing the streets and that means trying to get your ve the vehicles off the um, so out of the way so that our crews can come and clear the, and clear the streets the last major snow event in November led to traffic gridlock and people being stranded in their cars for hours it's not as severe this time around but still city officials say more is needed to prevent future disruptions these unprecedented events unfortunately are likely going to become more commonplace and if we don't have the right tools, we don't have the right knowledge and, and procedures and policies in place to deal with them, we're bound to repeat the mistakes we, we made on November 29th. But the snow didn't stop residents from making the most of it. It's exciting. I know that there are many people who don't like snow, but I love it right now. We haven't seen this much snow even when it was actually like Christmas time. Snowfall warnings are still in effect for much of southern BC, but Environment Canada says they are not expecting a significant snowfall. Ali Patarga, CBC News, Vancouver. Parts of Vancouver Island also saw a winter wallop of snow with 5 to 15 centimetres covering most of the island's east coast. The heavy snowfall, while fun to play in, caused power outages for thousands of people in the northern and southern part of the Vancouver Island Saturday night. Many of those homes are still without power today, but some families in Nanaimo are making the most of it. Nanaimo felt like Whistler. It was all caked in snow, the trees, it was beautiful. But by the time we got to Victoria, it was absolutely barren with snow. And then to have snow like we've had the last... 24 hours and then have a day like this where we're outside and kids are running around without their jackets on. Environment Canada says temperatures rose Sunday but will dip back down below freezing overnight which could cause a freeze thaw cycle and occasional flurries and that could lead to slippery conditions on the roads. 
Another string of earthquakes has rocked the peace region this month. The B.C. Energy Regulator, formerly the Oil and Gas Commission, have confirmed at least three were caused by industry activity. It comes just three months after two back-to-back -back quakes measuring more than 4.5 magnitude hit the region, some of the largest industry-recorded events in Western Canada. The B.C. Energy Regulator says it's taking a leadership role in detection and mitigation of seismic activity activity resulting from oil and gas extraction. Today, Premier David Eby announced $500 million in new funding for BC ferries to prevent rising fuel prices and inflation from spilling over into passenger fare increases. The costs are a concern. With global inflation and supply chain cost pressures, recent submissions to the BC Ferries Commissioner made it clear that users could face unacceptable fare hikes if we didn't step in. We're talking about a potential fare increase of more than 10% in each of the next four years. The province hopes the new funding will keep the annual increase in ferry tickets below 3%, though the final cost will be determined by the corporation's commissioner. EB says the money will go toward lowering greenhouse gas emissions through electric, 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 I can't get that word. Electric <laughs> We're moving on. <laughs> electric They're only vessels. run on electricity <laughs> when they're in dock. And uh, in order to make them fully electric, we need to have investments both to bring shore power to the terminal and to electrify the vessels. So it's a big investment, and uh, this will definitely help contribute to that investment. EB says this action is the latest in a series of measures the government has taken to support British Columbians with their day-to-day -day costs. The province is set to table its new budget on Tuesday. Community leaders in South Vancouver's Punjabi market are criticizing a proposal which would change some federal electoral boundaries and split two pillars of the South Asian community into different ridings. They say the move would impact decades of history. Yasmin Gandam reports. It's a, it's a visible example of our community here. For Gulzar Nanda, the Punjabi market is home. He has been working to revitalize the historic market district through the Punjabi Market Collective. He's worried new boundaries will split the local South Asian community in half, separating two community pillars, the Punjabi Market and the Khalsa Divan Society Gudwara. I think two pivotal moments in history, the Punjabi market being opened in uh, May 1970, the very first business, and the Gurdwara was established a month before that. I mean, that type of visibility was important to South Asians, and it's the reason they settled here. The Gurdwara and the Punjabi market are currently located in the riding of Vancouver South. The new boundaries would split the Sunset neighborhood along Fraser Street. The Punjabi market would go to Vancouver Arbutus, while the Gurdwara would be located in the Vancouver South riding. Splitting up our community uh, between Vancouver Arbutus and South Vancouver is just going to lead to a situation where our community's capacity is diminished. Gulzar is also concerned about the needs of residents in the Punjabi Market neighborhood overlooked in the new riding, which includes the affluent neighborhoods of South Granville and Shaughnessy. The demographics speak for themselves. I mean, there's a disparity in income levels. Uh, there's a disparity in terms of ethnicity. I think that, uh, you know, uh, we want to be strong, uh, our community, in terms of our political agency. Herb Dhaliwal was the first South Asian member of cabinet who represented the federal riding of Vancouver South in the late 90s. He's disappointed by the proposal. Yabi Market was sort of the heart of the riding going back to when I was elected in 93. And this whole area was very much a diversified, but had a lot of commonality in this area, stretching all the way to Knight Street, including the, uh, the Ross Street, Gurdwara, and uh, this was a, a very familiar area. The report is currently under review in Parliament. Nanda says the collective is lobbying Ottawa to keep the writings as they are. Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, Vancouver. As we near the end of Black History Month, a story about the challenges many black men experience on university campuses. Many report feelings of isolation and graduate at lower rates than other groups. Deanna Sumanak Johnson looks at initiatives to change that. 
when he arrived to University of British Columbia a few years ago, Gabriel Komla felt isolated and not just because he was missing his family back home. Coming from Nigeria where almost everyone and anyone is black to a place where it's hard to see a black person from majority to minority. It was a really big cultural shock. Statistics Canada findings revealed that a smaller percentage of black men aged 23 to 27 completed a university degree compared to other men. Black men were also less likely to have a university degree than black women of that age. And for those black men who make it to university, obstacles remain. Some of the barriers that are specific are socialization in the classroom, how to navigate microaggressions in the classroom, and of, often the, the common misperceptions of, oh, you must be here because you play football. For all these reasons, University of British Columbia recently started the Black Male Initiative, a student group that meets monthly. So it builds that camaraderie, almost kind of a fraternal group. Gabriel Komla has been attending. So BMI gives a few black males on campus to come together, share resources, and, you know, talk. In Ottawa, this professor remembers being randomly stopped by police while just riding his bicycle around campus. That was decades ago when he was a student, but more subtle barriers remain, and he wants to help put an end to them. This is part of my own ethical responsibility as someone who crossed the bridge to go back and hold some hands. <laughs> He believes the key to getting more young people to university starts while they're still in early high school. His new project pairs up black high school students with university mentors who can answer many of their questions. It kind of have already helped me kind of understand that I have a voice and it has given me a lot of resources both for school and outside of school such as like scholarships. Follow me to the uh, fourth floor. Helping make universities a place where all students can fulfill their potential, not spend time questioning if they belong. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. After two years of virtual events, more than 200 firefighters from across the province gathered at Vancouver's Wall Centre today. Their objective? To climb 48 stories of stairs to raise money for the BC Lung Foundation. Our Maurice Katz got geared up and was put to the ultimate test. I'm about to climb 48 flights of stairs with hundreds of firefighters and others helping raise money for kids with asthma. I've had asthma my entire life, but don't worry, I've got my inhaler with me. Oh, it's hard. I'm just trying to breathe. Yeah. These firefighters are going to do the same thing I just did, but with 50 pounds of gear on. Oh, yeah. You got the hands? Oh, God. This stuff is really heavy. I asked some of the climbers what makes this event so important to them. Our friend passed away a couple weeks ago, so we're honoring him with this climb. 23 years ago, my daughter had asthma, and I thought it was a good cause to help people with asthma. Mainly raising money for the children with asthma, um, but for a lot of the people on the job, obviously uh, lung cancer is really prevalent within our uh, career. So we had uh, a member pass away, um, Ken Kinney, a tin man, uh, in 2019. So just honoring him, and we're all doing it to support each other. Money raised from this year's 22nd event will go towards the Young Lung Foundation's Asthma Education Centre, providing education and support to the 100,000 children and youth in B.C. living with asthma. Organizers say the average time to reach the top floor is 15 minutes. Our Maurice completed the task in nine. This weekend marks the beginning of Ayamiha, a Baha'i festival focused on the importance of service, friendship, hospitality, charity, and gift giving. Today, families in Nanaimo came together to spread a little extra cheer to residents living in long-term care facilities through handmade crafts and cookie making. So people that might need a little cheering up or some, you know, joy in their hearts. The theme of today is joy gives us wings. So the kids are sort of considering what joyful crafts they can do for, for others in their community. Organizers say the purpose of the themed events is to instill kids with a strong sense of kindness and social justice. 
As businesses emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, more are trying to give back to those who helped them through tough times. A local barber shop in Victoria is doing just that by hosting a haircut fundraiser. We have been uh, supported and cared for and carried by our community, by our business associates, by our friends, our clients, our landlords, and uh, it's become a, a big part of our shop culture to kind of collectively recognize that. And uh, we don't want to stop there. We want to kind of turn around and take those good feelings and that good energy and pour back into our community. The event will benefit the Aboriginal Coalition to End Homelessness Society, a Victoria-based nonprofit that provides affordable housing and services to end Aboriginal homelessness on Vancouver Island. A wild few days in California where people are dealing with conditions some have never seen before. We'll bring you that story when we return. Stay with us. The memory of last September's deadly knife rampage remains fresh for James Smith Cree Nation. Now the suspect's former partner, Vanessa Burns, is one of the two survivors speaking out about that day. With an exclusive broadcast interview, the CBC's Olivia Stefanovic reports. Come on, come on. This, this is a community warning. Serious. From the outside, it was hard to know what was happening. 
Inside the tiny community, word grew that Miles Sanderson was on a murderous rampage. Everyone was fearing for their lives, especially his former partner, Vanessa Burns, and their five children. My son phoned me. I got a text from him too saying, Dad tried to kill me. Her 13-year-old was staying at her parents. He loaded a gun after Miles stabbed his grandma and grandpa. It was just so shocking. This wasn't the first time he attacked her parents. They tried to protect her from his constant abuse. But this time, her dad, Earl Burns Sr., died. I feel guilty. I wish I never met him. I feel like he just, he, he won, like he destroyed my family. I don't know, I kind of feel like a nightmare there, man, you know? Miles didn't just go after his children's grandparents. He also attacked his childhood friend. First, uh, the, uh, the paramedics counted 18 and I snapped out of it. Uh, they were counting like 20, 20 stab wounds, uh, a punctured lung. Somehow he survived, but he'll never understand the monster Miles became that day. I don't know what the hell he was on, man. Wasn't too, there wasn't Miles, I know that, man. I know, like. It's just like, I, did I even know him? <laughs> you know, like, was that really him? That's what I thought. Like, was he just faking it the whole time? Vanessa tried to save herself and her kids, but nothing could shield her family and friends that day. It's just like a never ending pain that's, it's just there every day. And I don't know, I'm just trying to get myself some help and it's just, it's not working. <laughs> it just hurts so much every day. But she keeps trying for the sake of her children and grandfather they love and lost. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, James Smith, Cree Nation. Over to international news. After spending much of the weekend digging out, people in parts of California are now bracing for another blast of winter weather. From blizzards to heavy rains to ferocious winds, the state has taken a pounding. Here's Susanna De Silva with more on how people are getting through it. The third RV to end up in the muddy water of the Santa Clara River in Valencia Park, 40 minutes north of L.A. No one was hurt, but it made for a scary morning. There was knocks on everybody's doors, and um, I thought I was just dreaming. You know, you hear sounds, and I could see um, people pulling people out right here. So I haven't been able to get uh, back and forth to work for a couple of days, and also I'm just kind of afraid we're going to have to evacuate if it gets any worse. From heavy rains leading to dramatic rescues to flooding, including this major highway, leaving this driver stranded on his Porsche to unusual locations for snow like the foothills around L.A., Southern California has been battered. It was the first time the National Weather Service office in San Diego had issued a blizzard warning for their mountains. Los Angeles has only seen rain like this a handful of times since records began way back in 1877, and more extreme weather is expected. You know, looking at additional rain and snow across central and northern parts of the state uh, Monday through Wednesday, that will shift to Southern California and bring some additional rain and snow, but not looking at the amounts that we did earlier in the week. It all likely means several more long days for Adrian Bravilla in Sacramento, helping people not used to these conditions. We've been going for quite a while, you know, a couple, couple days, but get a couple hours of sleep and come back, hit it again, do some sanding, keep people safe and keep going. In preparation, Yosemite National Park is closed through Wednesday because of the threat of blizzards. While closer to L.A. at Big Bear Lake, all eyes have been on a pair of eagles working hard to try and keep their eggs warm, a job that won't get much easier for at least the next few days. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Here we have a live shot of downtown Vancouver in the beautiful Georgia Viaduct. I love seeing all those lights lit up at night. I'll have your full forecast coming up next.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On March 29th, join Leanne Young at the Zilly Cares Conversation on Care, a mental health fundraiser with special guests Dr. Gabo Mate and Dr. Mariam Zainadin. Get your tickets at zillycare.com. And never miss a special programming, series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. All right, it is time now to take a look at your forecast. Let's begin with a look at the current temperatures around the regions. One degree in West Vancouver, same at the Vancouver Airport. Zero degrees in Pitt Meadows, one degree in, degree in Abbotsford, and three degrees in Bellingham. Moving over to tomorrow's forecast, let's begin in Dees Lake. Minus 11 degrees for tomorrow with a 60% chance of flurries. A wind chill, however, of minus 26. So definitely bundle up. Over in Port Hardy, five degrees, rain and flurries or snowfall for tomorrow. Prince Rupert, three degrees, 60% chance of flurries or rain. Over in Cranbrook, a mix of sun and clouds for you tomorrow, a high of one degree and a few flurries. Williams Lake, mainly sunny, wind chill, minus 15. And let's take a look at our five-day forecast here in Metro Vancouver. That rain will stick around for tomorrow and Tuesday with a high of three degrees tomorrow and five degrees on Tuesday. Then that sun is going to come out nice and bright on Wednesday with a high of four degrees. But then that rain is going to come back on Thursday and Friday with a high of five degrees on Thursday and eight degrees on Friday. Well, that is your late news for this Sunday. Thanks so much for watching. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbc.ca/bc. Have a great night.